Okay, so uh, hello, good evening. Thank you very much for coming here. Uh, we would talk about one uh, professional uh, route and one professional biography, which is um, uh, somehow got a very specific coloring here in the name of this uh, uh, last for today talk in the salon. I'm talking with Netko Sulakov, and my name is Yara Bubnova. We are both uh, from Sofia, Bulgaria, and we are nominated as uh, uh, survivors of socialism and chaotic post-totalitarian times. So somehow we will try to talk about uh, mainly uh, Netko Sulakov, his uh, um, art career, his works, uh, which are usually based on his inner narratives connected with his personal biography, so somehow it will be partly about socialism and post-socialism, but it will be much more about uh, uh, struggle and uh, living and doing things in spite of conditions and in spite of the situation and the context in which we uh, still stay, then about uh, surviving. Specifically, it's difficult to say that we survived already socialism plus uh, chaotic post-totalitarian transition times because we had, uh, uh, not so long ago, elections in our country, in Bulgaria again, and the results of the elections demonstrate that uh, survivalist uh, qualities would be needed for the next future for many people, uh, for artists included. Uh, so, um, we prepared a small presentation here. It's small because it's only uh, very specific and very um, short excerpt from uh, what Netko Sulakov is doing. It's dedicated somehow to uh, real existence in socialism and post-socialist maybe um, strategies to communicate with the whole world coming after uh, or from the um, Iron Curtain covered and colored in this grayish iron uh, color, space of culture and specifically space of knowledge. Our presentation uh, starts with one, I don't know where I have to, ah, yeah. Uh, starts with uh, one very significant, uh, from my point of view, to Netko Sulakov's uh, uh, history of uh, image and story production work. It named uh, fears, and here the image of uh, uh, the installation of small drawings, 99 drawings, fears, uh, how they are presented at Documenta 12, uh, already, I would say, five, six years ago. Uh, 99 uh, fears, are there all fears, Netco, or do you have some other fears for the next series? How is about drawing fears? Uh, I had at least like a hundred, so the hundred one was uh, 15 minutes ago that there will be not enough people at that talk. <laughs> Apparently it's kind of uh, working now that fear. No, there are much more. Much more, so there's still more to, to draw, but uh, I'm trying to draw also some other... How it <laughs> happened that you started to classify somehow, to archive your fears? Do you have, uh, we were here um, listening to uh, the nice talk of uh, Gavin Turk, and he was asked about the titles of his works. And uh, he explained and he was talking about how the titles are parts of the works that they are not coming in front of and, and before the works themselves are produced. Do you have a catalog and then you are making drawings, or when you are drawn, uh, fears appear and appear more and more? Uh, specifically, that work was uh, done... Uh, uh, specifically, this was Bulgarian language, uh, that which is uh, exchanged between each other. Uh, the work was done for uh, Documenta in 2007, Documenta 12. Originally, I was invited to present for sure one work which is called Top Secret. You might uh, remember it from 2007 Documenta, and uh, Yara will, will show it a little bit later. And uh, then uh, I was asked by the curators, what else can you propose us? And then I was thinking about a big installation called Some Nice Things to Enjoy While You Are Not Making a Living, which was still supposed to be done with a lot of uh, components. And that work was kind of in between. And I'd say, let's make also a series of drawings called uh, 99 Fears, called Fears. And they happen to be 99. Whenever I do drawings, I never kind of think in advance. 
So here maybe I started uh, making the drawings of these uh, little fellows and uh, I'm also, as you see, kind of chubby guy, to put it mildly. I'm fat, actually. And uh, so maybe it's a kind of a self-portrait with uh, seven men like me trying to postpone death. Mm. Mm. Sorry. Is that type of uh, symbolical, very specific metaphoric drawing about the fear? Uh, this maybe is the most popular among fears, among all people whom I know, something unknown that's waiting for you. And because we are here uh, nominated as people after, so we had these uh, conditions and these situations, everybody in one or another way had to open a door or a window or a tiny something to open it and to see how life is going on beyond things that you used to know and that you used to live with, sometimes unsatisfied, but normally you used to. Uh, because I guess this somehow is connected with the top secret, the work uh, that you mentioned that was uh, uh, already the logic of this work is connected to the survivalist strategies and to struggle and oppositional strategies in our society, in our culture. I don't know, I don't see a direct connection with, uh, with this. But uh, yeah, that is the, the second piece which was presented uh, six years ago, a documentary, the one that the curators really wanted to be included. Uh, it's called Top Secret. And uh, the juicy part inside of this uh, chest, when I'm saying in alphabetical order, a lot of uh, kind of secrets about my personal life. The most juicy part, which is actually in a very small uh, as you see, you have at the beginning, uh, on the left-hand side, you have something dark, then it's something brownish, then it's again dark, and then you have a kind of a small pile of whitish. So over there is written uh, kind of a secret, really like a shameful secret, as is described in the media of the piece. Uh, when I'm saying that when I was a young student, between uh, 76 and 83, I had contacts with the Bulgarian Secret Service. And this was exhibited uh, publicly in early 1990. Uh, didn't make a scandal at the beginning. Two months later, I had a kind of a scandal in Bulgaria. And even now, I could say that I made up that one in order years later to be invited for documenta. So still there are no publicly known documents about my involvement with uh, state security. In Bulgaria, the files, they're still closed in general. Only they check the politicians, and I'm not going to run for politician. But no, this is really true, but it's only an artwork. By the way, uh, just like a in parentheses, I graduated 81, mural painting in Bulgaria, and I was making paintings till 89. Uh, that uh, secret was kind of really being having burden for, for me in my chest. And uh, I made at least two paintings which they were on that subject. And later on, immediately after the changes, I started and within the course of two months, between December 89 and February 1990, I made that work. So sometimes in the mid-80s, I started making, uh, together with a group of artists called the City Group, uh, kind of assemblages, small installations. And even though we were five uh, well-established young painters in Bulgaria, uh, we were considered to be a kind of an avant-garde artist because uh, we ended up with an exhibition which was like a done with installations. But this was not like in the 60s or in the 50s, this was in 88, pretty late. So when the changes came, and afterwards, I, after that piece, I left the Union of Artists, which was our art world in Bulgaria. I kind of put my face towards the West. And then it started a kind of a survival <laughs> strategy, which uh, the biggest problem of this survival strategy is that there was no strategy at all. And you, even the tactical, on a tactical level, the things that were extremely unprofessional. I made so many alphabetical mistakes until I kind of started slowly taking part in proper shows. Uh, that's why actually I would like to ask you because we talk a little bit about, so to say, about before the end of socialism, the production of fears and uh, uh, secrets and how to deal with the reality of life. We have, maybe if somebody does know, we have to admit that actually there are many things of the infrastructure of contemporary art which are missing normally in, in every, so to say, if you can use this word normal, uh, totalitarian, we named it at that time socialist society. Uh, so the infrastructure, for example, has no market, which means there are no collectors. The state is the only collector 
and the state market uh, had been the only one known for us and the whole logic of relations between uh, uh, an art market, uh, art production, artistic position uh, and collecting, which is after, you know, the word collecting comes museums and other things was absolutely, totally new. Um, I guess, I mean, the situation like here, for example, in Art Basel was very difficult to imagine. That's why I put into the slides uh, uh, this first drawing, the preparation for the first presentation of the installation named the uh, Collector of Art, uh, which was done by Netco at the beginning of the 90s, pretty soon after, you know, all those doors and things had been opened. And I will, uh, uh, unfortunately, I have because of the logic of the uh, visual presentation, I have to go through to find out where the uh, real installation, its later appearance, maybe one of the latest appearances uh, last year is done. Uh, how you learned the collecting logic, the relations between the artist and the collector, how this piece appeared. And I will uh, uh, find the... I don't know, can you read the text? The text says somewhere in Africa there is a great black man collecting art from Europe and America. And uh, now the present day is the title, also says uh, collecting art from Europe and America, buying his Picasso for 23 cocoa nuts or his early Rauschenbach for seven antelope bones. And uh, I got this idea when I was uh, for six months in Zurich. There is this wonderful museum called Riedberg showing uh, African Polynesian art, fantastic. And uh, I was really struck by these beautiful artifacts and the small busts of the donators, like a rich uh, Zurich people. And then I got the idea what will happen if it's just the other way around. To have this uh, great uh, black man who lives somewhere in Africa and who collects uh, in this very strange way. Uh, modern art and, and, uh, from Europe and America. This is one of the last installments of the piece. Uh, it's uh, just an uh, idea of African hut because uh, ethnographically it's, it's just real nonsense, but becomes kind of real when you realize that the piece in the center is, uh, is a real er 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 Rocher. The one in front is, uh, is a real Sildo Meireles, or you have uh, very early uh, Kiefer, or you have da Douglas Gordon. Of course, you have only the tapes there because there is no electricity, but he really loved the situation. But they're all original works. All of them, they're original works from the Seraves uh, collection. And there are particular stories which they had written on these pieces of cardboards, explaining, uh, telling the story how he got them, the, the black collector. And uh, for the first installment, the piece was done in uh, 1994 at Ludwig Museum in Budapest, where again I borrowed real artworks from the collection. As a, as a goods, as a merchandise, the piece consists of, I call it not edition, it's a variant of four, Number one belonged to, uh, if you return back, and then I can show actually the, the number one. Number one belongs to the museum in, uh, in Lyon. And uh, number two belongs to the museum in, uh, in Smak, in Ghent. And uh, number three, hopefully, will enter maybe the, <laughs> the collection of Seraus. Do you remember your, your, meeting with the, your first meeting with a collector? With the black collector? No, with, with, with a collector in your artistic life, do you remember? It's difficult to meet collectors on your native ground, so it's supposed to be somewhere else, I guess. No, before, before the changes, there was, yeah, there was a one young collector who was a doctor, dermatologist, Dr. Gatev is his name, and uh, he kind of really liked my work, and then I saw him the work. Uh, later on, of course, after the changes, you start meeting collectors here. For... Uh, now I know a lot of people and they really like, uh, would like to communicate with me and I, and I like to communicate with them. It is obviously a project, a kind of an underdog one. So you really would like to enter that art world as I wanted that time in 92. And uh, you want to be among the other guys, like uh, being on the place of the black collector in some way. Years later, I'm also collecting myself. Part of it I'm swapping and the other part I'm buying out, including from that fair. So years later, I really wondered how I'm going to, to do that uh, reinstallment of the piece if my attitude might change meanwhile. Because uh, on the walls at home, I have uh, Paul McCarthy, or I have Pettibone, and I have uh, Namjoon Pike and Lawrence Wiener. But uh, it's fine. The Black Collector still functions as an underdog. Um, your stories usually include some type of 
acid humor of the person at the beginning, it was maybe of the person who is looking from a side, specifically critical attitude or comments, maybe not so critical attitude, but comments towards the existence and the functioning of uh, the art world. Uh, and uh, I would like to ask you, here is part of an exhibition, of course, but here is this uh, yellow thing on the wall, uh, which belongs to one particular story, and the yellow thing that becomes so popular and during years changed a little bit uh, his appearance and his meaning. Can you say somehow how it comes, the yellow thing? That yellow blob here, uh, the context of that uh, work is uh, the last part of a big retrospective which I had the last two years, starting at Icon in Birmingham, going to Smack in Ghent, and this is Serauves in Porto. Uh, it's a very complicated, really beautiful space designed by Caesar. And uh, the corridor that you are going to see in a, in a second, you will see that uh, actually this yellow blob, it's called the yellow blob story. This yellow moves through the corridor, and at the beginning, you really don't know what will be the purpose of that yellow thing. Usually, it could cover like a very small spot, or it can cover, if you want, the entire the entire fair. No, but but it's but it's now in this show. But the the yellow blood has a much longer history. It was uh, incorporated in one particular story as well. I remember the story, but maybe you can uh, remind the story itself. The, the project was called The Absent-Minded mm. Man. Yeah. Yeah. But The Absent-Minded Man was done back again in 97 and uh, belonged to a kind of a maybe trilogy of uh, works. One was uh, The Paranoid Man, the other one was The Absent-Minded Man, and I really forgot what was the third one. <laughs> maybe I'm becoming absent-minded. The, the superstitious. And the superstitious, she remembers mm. that. This mm -hmm. one I keep going in that direction. Uh, this is actually the plan, what we're showing is the plan of this, uh, one of the latest uh, exhibitions and projects, <clears throat> which are named, entitled All in Order with Exceptions. But the logic of the yellow blob for me is very interesting because here uh, it creates and somehow points on uh, very particular relations between art artist and uh, uh, empathic relation of the audience with this art. That's why, again, I have to uh, turn the slides and uh, uh, this is something white appeared uh, to come back to uh, you know to the this is corridor and this is this yellow thing which is growing and going to different places because of the absent mindedness but uh, uh, yeah you can see how in many places it appears and disappears again without uh, somehow planned logic maybe only because of the connection with this very large scale absent-mindedness. But my interest here is about uh, uh, the connection of all in order, how things in order appeared, because normally you put your Yeah, but you just, uh, audiences, you just went through the order to, and now I have to return back in order to explain what was the, the meaning yeah, of it that is, order. It's, this is how you, you, can you start with 92? <laughs> no. You have to go from the very beginning of that room. OK. First of all, to tell you why it's called all in order with exceptions. Uh, three curators from three institutions, they agreed to play a really kind of a, a little bit silly game. They came for two days in Sofia and in very early 2011, and knowing my work in general, for two days, we went through all the works I've done for the last 30 years, starting from 81 when I graduated the Art Academy, and ending up in 2010. They saw in originals most of the works which they had done before 89. At the end of the second day, with consensus, me being only a registrar, kind of a secretary, they selected the best works for each year. I didn't interfere at all. And uh, then, when they returned back home, each one selected only one work per year out of this pool of good works. And I was extremely strict on that. So you have to take only one work per year. It was not possible to be two. And I'm really grateful to these three uh, museum directors and curators because they agreed to play a game which had at least two really silly rules inside. One was that, that supposedly I became an artist after graduating the academy, which you know very well that it can't be true in general. And then that at least 
I had one work worth to be presented in retrospective during these 30 years of production. And uh, then was uh, really like uh, my uh, logic and my way of doing things with my, my work that uh, was put into my hands and my mind, and I really had to deal with some really, really tough choices. For example, the two institutions, one with SMAC and one in Seralves, they selected to work. Can you return back, please? Okay, so here you see this is the entrance of the shell. On the left-hand side, you see there is, a, there is a text which is ready to be transferred on the wall. It's a vinyl text, and you just stick there. And there is a very official label on a, on a stick which stays, and it's a message from the director of the museum. The text is a so-called, it's a work called Insolent Art. At this moment, this was number nine. And the, number eight, sorry. And the text says, you, viewer, are part of an audience which, especially in this part of Africa, and I'll tell you why it's Africa later. You are not important, so important for my career. Therefore, I don't see the reason to exhibit something more substantial here. And, you know, if the curator selected that work to be presented for year 2004, ideally that work could function if there is no exhibition at all. So you have like a 2,000 square meters with no exhibition, only that one there. And this was the tricky part for me, how I to present the work and at the same time to have an exhibition. So what I invented was that actually that work belonged to the black collector, which you saw already the, you all saw already all the huts. And in that very official label, which was done by the museum director, they say that at the very last moment, this the so-called black collector, he pulled out the loan so we can't show the work, which you can see it only as a preparation for vinyl lettering. Uh, looks that you are trying very often to stretch uh, the patience, let's say, of the curators dealing with it. Do you find it as an interactive logic in the topic of our talk today about learning and studying of things how to do and how to, to learn something by yourself and to teach others how to deal with this thing? This is an in, in interactive in many cases. You negotiate every step or you make decisions. You gave the curators a possibility to make a selection. Uh, who did a decision that the selection of one per year artwork starts actually after your graduation? It's yours. This is mine. Yeah. And but on the other hand, I didn't complain at all about certain works, like that one, for example. And I uh, say, You said you didn't complain. You can complain in the I terms. didn't complain, but uh, I, if I have to be honest, I kind of blackmailed them with that, with that work. Because, you know, it's a Portugal. And Portugal, besides of my really like a fondness about uh, the curator and all the team, it's a little bit uh, like a Brazilian going way, in some ways, organization-wise. So there was a kind of a democleus, or how it's said in English, uh, sort above their heads, because I say, if something doesn't function, I will close the show. I will just go into maximum with that work called incident art number eight. Did I answer your question? No. Uh, you answered somehow. Um, because so for example, sorry, you asked me, ask me about how this order was shown there. The exhibition is called Tori in order with exceptions. Uh, that really long corridor, I measured the corridor very carefully. They were supposed to be presented, I think, like a 14 years, 14 works, completely different from each other. And afterwards, we really measured it like that, and it became kind of a ping pong. On very equal intervals, you have a work. This is like a 82, 83, 84, 85, like that. And sometimes you have ridiculous... Can you go on, please? And I wrote one more. And I wrote uh, what I did there under one of the paintings. So you can, uh, you can read uh, how many centimeters between that year and another year. Go for the please. So you see, sometimes if you have like a group of works, then you take the middle one and it's exactly there, but sometimes it becomes ridiculous because the work is very close, for example, to the fire extinguisher or a certain door. Or how it appears later on, so that body of work, the Venetian blind was just exactly in the middle of it. So the so-called uh, well-known stories, which they're based on the Bible, but from a little bit uh, Monty Python-esque uh, point of view, they were kind of split. And here you can see one of the drawings there, which, uh, yeah, this is exactly the middle of the Venetian blind when the work was supposed to be shown. 
and uh, you all recognize the, the iconography of the Bethlehem Slaughter and that lady who was really pissed of having so many children, so she's bringing her old children or the old child to the, to the slaughter there. Something is not in order with the uh, whole story because, uh, um, I mean, how we are trying to interpret what you are doing and the logic of, uh, uh, on the, so to say, background of the historical context that w was uh, offered to us in this uh, situation, this system, and we like to go back from this uh, retrospective, if you don't mind, to something which is connected with Basel and with one of the interesting for me uh, experiences of the later uh, days uh, spent here and actually something that we learned already in Venice. You know, you're coming to a big exhibition and you wait in a queue. And because I know that this work actually produced a queue already many years ago, somehow I thought uh, that maybe it was one of the first examples, at least in the context of Basel uh, Unlimited, to people to think that they have to queue to see an artwork. What was this year? No, this was not really. The, it, there were queues before that. I think this was 2009. The work is called Beauty. And you have this uh, fluffy, uh, nice to be touched object, which uh, looked very much like uh, uh, many other fluffy and shining and uh, kind of meaningless objects. <laughs> which they're fooling around. But when you knee inside, you can spot out this, uh, this crescent moon. And the work is called Beauty. It was kind of popular, and the people, they were supposed to, to kneel and to, to present their butts, to view of their butts to, to the other people. Some of them, they did, some they didn't. Or if they did it, they did it in a very twisted uh, manner. Twisted? <laughs> yeah. This is another way of playing with the audience. There is a place in uh, Kitokushu in Japan, which is called Center for Contemporary Art, CCA Kitokushu. This is their space. It is four meters 50 high. And uh, I made a lot of little stories, which you see that there is something written there. There might be an object, but then you can't really read what is there. Then it comes a specially produced catalog with close-ups of these stories. The show was called a high-level show with a catalog. And the reaction, so you can see, for example, this is like a one of the pages, a lonely wire, which was just sitting there on 450 above. Uh, of course, uh, uh, the Japanese people, they were not really into my sense of humor. Also, I really forced them to go from, uh, from left to right, not the other way around. But they were very polite, so they look up and they look at for the translation of the story and the story itself, and then they move to the other one. A little bit the same like this. Uh, again, trying to uh, a little bit move you back to the historical context that we're supposed to, uh, to stay in the frames of. Um, this is another work which is connected somehow, for me at least, it's connected with new options and possibilities of the person who went through uh, a lot of things. It's uh, the piece done on the border, on physically on the border in the airport, with some comments written on the border, aside of that many of the people who come here to Basel, they use this border in the airport of Zurich. Aside of that, how you actually managed to deal with the, this type of conditions? This was at uh, the Zurich airport, and it was part of an exhibition uh, organized by Miriam Verdin, curator at the Kunsthaus Zurich. So what I did was this past controlled stories with the permission of the, of the border people, of the police, uh, uh, I made uh, in the middle of the night when there were no uh, visitors, of course, no uh, passengers. I made uh, through all the booths, all of these little kiosks at the airport, tiny, uh, quite nasty comments. This one says, for example, a man with uh, three heads and three passports. And uh, that one says, uh, it's quite expensive here. Are you sure you want to enter? Talking about Zurich. Uh, the next day, unfortunately, even though they gave permission, uh, the, the authorities, they say that there were a lot of people complaining and they had to remove all of them. Luckily, I made the documentation as soon as I write it and I did the documentation right away, just sensing what will happen at the end of the day. 
Do you remember who complained more, uh, the border police or the people who have to cross the border? Who was the most the unsatisfied? Border police, the border police said that the people, the passengers complained, which I guess was not true at all. They just got scared. I'm scared of flying, by the way. So uh, which has another I came here by car story. and uh, that piece, which is called Fear, another fear. Uh, I was invited by a Biennale in Albisolo in Italy to take part uh, with ceramic produced uh, piece. And uh, what I did, I asked uh, they to set me some bowls of low, uh, raw clay. And uh, on 10 flights, when I was flying, now I'm not flying since 2008. When I was flying, I was constantly like uh, making like that, uh, having, getting pills and really scared, touching the airplane for good luck and so on. So I carried these raw pieces of clay in my hands on 10 flights and I stopped the project when the flight was supposed to reappear, like uh, Sofia Frankfurt, for example. Afterwards, this was fired and uh, you can be sure that inside you have my fear, which was up there on 10,000 uh, meters above the ground and it's exhibited in a way with uh, text explaining the story. And uh, with the next slide, I but was... But when you were flying, still... When I was flying still, this was uh, another way to make kind of more friendly that uh, airplane. And uh, this was a project called On the Wing and involved uh, six Boeing 737, 737 from the Luxembourg Air Fleet. Uh, the bad ones, the ones that they crash into into the World Trade Center. So it took us uh, uh, like a six months to convince them. And uh, at the end of the day, we placed 14 messages on 12 wings, which they're readable only from the window seats. And they fly for like a two years with this. From the window seats on one side? No, no, both sides. So you have the right wing and the left wing. Some of them like a longer story, some of them are like a really uh, dumb stories, like on the left wing is written, the same text appears on the right wing, but you better check, or here is written, the same text appear on the left wing, but you better check. Um, I would like to show one particular dreamy story, which is uh, in this context incorporated into the retrospective, but uh, uh, aside of the retrospective, it's one of my beloved, so to say, jokes about uh, uh, art and history and about dreams of an artist who lives in the margins uh, of the so-called uh, continent of centers of art and contemporary art. Uh, this uh, um, installation is named El Bulgaro. It's done already almost 14, 14 years ago, 13 years ago. And again, it consists of a story of a missing thing, of something which is uh, uh, which would be helpful for branding and would be helpful for professional career, the story about non-existing artists who uh, actually happened to be in comparison with El Greco, the artist who lived in Spain and came from Greece that's supposed to be such as artists somewhere that artist exists and you made the whole story with the uh, paintings and documentation of the existence of the artist what was your feeling, that you are crossing your own context or you are mocking this lack of branding? Do you know what I'm thinking at the moment? That we were supposed to talk about our post something survival and uh, we are not talking about this. <laughs> I think we are, frankly. We say. are, but the people are okay, interested talk and they're already like, a, like a six or seven of them left. And uh, Talk about survival. It's hard to survive if you come from a country which nobody knows anything about Bulgaria. Some people, they know that there is a Christo Evashev, this famous Christo. Some of them, they think that it's Romanian, but uh, some of them, they think that it's Bulgarian. And that's it. It was extremely hard for me when I started in the early 90s going out and you have such a flood from East European artists and uh, uh, Russian artists flooding, especially like a Switzerland. It happened to be for six months in Zurich and in residence in 92. And it was so hard, you already achieved certain status in Bulgaria and here nobody knows anything about you. And it was really hard to get to know the people, to get to know you. Then it took me a real, real struggle up to mid 90s to convince the people you already passed through even faster through the, my so-called retrospective. And you see that it looks like it's a very big group show because all the works visually, they look done by different artists. 
And uh, it took me quite some time, the people to get to know that this might be a positive quality, the visual diversity in my work. And believe me, but it's a really positive quality because now when I'm doing such kind of retrospective, I can really play with this and at least the shows, they are not boring. Uh, or at least I, I think so. And Who would uh, like me to help you to survive? What to find out in the... Another thing, uh, another thing. Uh, logic of images. My first gallery show, now we're in a fair, so everybody talks about sales, about galleries. My first gallery show was <laughs> in 96, and I already had three museum solo shows which uh, in a way helped me afterwards because uh, the galleries, they already took me with this uh, me selling work on my own and now they still, they still don't complain if I sell to institutions on my own. There was a certain moment when I worked like uh, with uh, seven, six galleries. Can you show the, uh, the leftovers? And some of them, I'm not working anymore with them, but then because of that, seven, eight galleries working with, I was able to have a project which was called uh, Leftovers, a selection of my unsold pieces from the private galleries I work with. And this is the Leftovers as it was installed in uh, Kunsthaus uh, Zurich. So it was like a giant storage room when you have the pieces which nobody really wanted to buy so far. Instead of me borrowing the best works from public and private collections I've done, I showed the crap that nobody really wanted to buy. In a way, I produce an artwork, then I give it to the dealer, and afterwards, because of that project, I took it back to me in some way, and I put it in another context. By the way, meanwhile, 70% of this work got sold. From the show? Uh, no, meanwhile, like uh, gradually, gradually. And we did, we did also, uh, the catalog was really nicely done by Walter Koenig, and you have a very specific uh, uh, signatures of uh, uh, this or that work belonging to this or that uh, gallery we presented. Also, all the works, they were done with their prices, which was completely unusual to have their prices there. And we made a small edition with, uh, uh, like, uh, I think, uh, I don't know, 100 books with Walter Koenig, and the edition was, you get a book, you get uh, also uh, a sheet with red dots, and then regularly, you leave your email, regularly I'm updating you how many of the words got sold and you put the red dots on your own, on the respective pages. And? And uh, I still have leftovers. That's, <laughs> that's the biggest problem. But uh, everybody has leftovers. You know, in my country, even though they're extremely rich people, there are still no collectors. So it's a, this is a real problem. There is no real gallery system except for uh, like a one gallery where all of us we're working with. It's called Seriev. So it's very hard. On the other hand, uh, I am in this straddling position, still based in Sofia. And uh, the other foot is in the West, traveling constantly for exhibitions and returning back to Sofia because one of the very few good things, which they're on the surface good thing, is that uh, the income tax I'm paying is 6%. We have a 10% flat, flat tax, and because I also, I'm also an artist, I have 40% tax deductible for production costs, but I'm not supposed to prove them. That's why I immediately make it 6%, and to whoever I say this, they say, all of us, let's go to move to Bulgaria. Of course, this is bad. That's why we are the poorest country in Europe. This was uh, me as a knight, part of the, proje the project I did for the last uh, documenter called Nights and Other Dreams. And it's a really long project. So... Actually, what I was <laughs> trying to find out is not uh, uh, this project, even I think that it deserves several things. But you did uh, uh, not so long ago, actually, it was the last, uh, it was like a year ago, a couple of years ago, the project which was named I Miss Socialism, maybe. So why you miss it then? In the text, this was done in my gallery, uh, Continua, in Beijing. They had a big space there. And uh, in the text, I was saying that actually I'm not really missing the socialism. I'm just missing my youth when I was uh, much, much younger with a uh, little bit more hair on my head and I was much thinner. So you see this uh, uh, big, uh, beautifully done uh, sophos like a hieroglyphs. Uh, can you give the, the next one? So this one says, I miss socialism, maybe. Uh, all of them. 
and you have uh, uh, many videos which uh, they were done for the last uh, 15, 20 years, and uh, some of them they related to the themes, some of them they just show like the, like the confused uh, life of a middle-aged man which was still missing his, uh, his youth. And the big brother is, uh, is watching from above. And uh, uh, can, I, can I say something moment. here? Yeah. Again, we are in a commercial fair. Uh, I took deliberately the decision here in that work. I don't know, maybe, maybe some of you. <laughs> maybe some of you saw, saw the work, uh, saw the work in Documenta. And I tried to do my best that work to look as if it is done specially for that museum, which is very hard to convince somebody that if this is done specially for that museum and everything is taken into consideration that you can take it out of that museum, let's say, in your collection. But uh, this was my like a real decision. I really wanted to make it that way. I borrowed some strategies of the way they are doing exhibitions in that Brothers Gimm Museum in Kassel and uh, everything was fixed really according to that space. So, so sooner or later I have to do it in a more universal type of space in order to try to put it somewhere. But I think you have to say what it is all about with the I think uh, we don't really have time to do that. Uh, uh, basically, I was dealing with uh, dreams, real dreams. Like, for example, the dream of my dream is to be a drummer in a hard rock band. But then I, because of the story, I invented different other dreams of mine, like to, to have a suit of armor or another semi-invented dreams. Uh, it's a really like a long story that we don't really have the time. But at least uh, uh, explain the, the ending, what of the dreams was uh, fulfilled with the So at the end of this, drumming. a lot of hundreds of sub-stories and 12 films, which all together is like a five hours. Uh, the very end uh, says uh, that I should have left all of these dreams to stay in my head, not to try to, to realize them, which was kind of the final conclusion of the show. And of course, saying that, uh, of course, I was saying, OK, it's not so bad that I led them and made them in all of these rooms. Um, there are, of course, some other images, but um, if your explanation about uh, survivalist strategies or with the background of the art fair and uh, discovering of an art market produced some uh, questions, maybe it has sense uh, uh, to hear the questions if somebody would like to ask them. Uh, otherwise, I guess I have one of the uh, last works of yours and which I think has some sense have questions? in the context. Excuse me. Yeah. Yeah, so, the question is, no, no, no. Uh, so the question is during socialism time, you know, until uh, 1990, 1989, whenever it fell down, because of the constant big brother looking down upon and constant scrutiny from the authorities, do you feel like during those years you had to be a little more, you know, creative in order to express yourself through your works of art as opposed to today where it's you know pretty much democracy and you can do whatever you want to whereas back in the day you had to be a little more creative to get your, get your way around i'm just curious to know your opinion your thoughts on that i would not say so you know very well that now in democracy you feel free but you feel free from certain things and you are not free at all in other things and believe me if i experienced the first non-freedom and part of this non-freedom nowadays, it's very hard to say which one is worst. So it's really up to you how to look at the world and uh, how to confront the world and to be in a constant position to be a little bit aside and to try to, to kind of uh, looking critically to, to that uh, society which is uh, around you and anyhow you're part of it as well. But it doesn't really matter so much was it socialism or was it this uh, kind of wild capitalism which is in the present Bulgaria. I'm wondering, um, uh, do you see commonalities between artists in different post-socialist contexts? Can, can, can you? Can yeah, you? Oh, sorry about that. Um, I'm wondering if you see commonalities between artists in different post-socialist contexts, like were you very deliberate about doing the show at Continua in China, thinking about um, the Chinese audience, or? Uh, yes, I was thinking about the Chinese audience, and I was extremely pleasantly surprised of the quantity of people who came, very young people, and they reacted extremely positively about this. Of course, I was making a, a kind of a fun on myself, 
and this was the only country that they can do that, knowing that they still have kind of a state socialism, and I'm coming from another kind of socialism. Uh, apparently, uh, all of these doubts, they were okay for any kind of authorities because there was no complaints whatsoever, and the uh, young people, they really enjoyed the, the attitude. Do you think that the experience of artists in, in places like China or other places in Eastern Europe or Russia, do you see like similarities or commonalities between your attitude, your approach, your work? Of course, we belong to a kind of uh, one or two generations, and we're trying to... I don't really see similarities. No. I feel, I feel like a very close, uh, very close friend to, to some artists, fellow artists from, uh, let's say, from Slovakia, like uh, Roman Ondek or from uh, Romania, Dan Pejowski. We share one common attitude, and uh, we might say that we belong to a kind of a... I don't know, it's uh, one generation, but I don't see similarities. Any other questions? Just another question asking you to draw a parallel, but this time a uh, parallel between uh, the audience or, or the people who uh, look at your art here and uh, in your country. Because uh, you uh, didn't mention, but uh, you had a retrospective in Sofia as well. And I think Yara was curating that retrospective. Uh, what a quick, maybe in a nutshell, a parallel of working uh, with a gallery or a museum in Bulgaria and working uh, with gallery and museum uh, here in this part of Europe? It's a good question, and frankly speaking, in the, uh, in the first selection of images that we prepared with Yara, there were like at least five images of that uh, retrospective she curated with another fellow curator. But we kind of decided that maybe it would be not interesting for the audience to have this. And, uh, it was in 2009, and my previous big show in Sofia was 20 years earlier. And uh, this was, the, in a way, the beginning of uh, placing the works in a, in a very simple chronological order, but in a, in a very, very casual way. I didn't, uh, I didn't touch anything on the infrastructure of that Sofia City Gallery. All the plinths, all the pedestals, they look extremely ruined, and I just left them like that. And the paintings and objects, they were leaning like this. It was a kind of a giant meandering of the years between the 70s up to 2009. And for the first time, I showed a, a live black and white. We had like an image of that piece. Do you know that work of mine? Uh, it consists of two painters. One is with white paint, the other one with white, black paint. And they're constantly repainting the space of, the, uh, of a certain given space following each other for like a five uh, months uh, as, uh, yeah, you have, uh, you have, this was the most uh, kind of spectacular presentation in Venice Biennale in 2001. So for the first time in Bulgaria, I show it like this, the outside uh, of that labyrinth, they were like a painting around uh, my life. Uh, the reactions, they were different. I have to say, uh, if I have to prefer something, uh, I can't say which one I prefer, what type of reactions. In, this picture of perspective I had in this uh, several places, there were like a lot of people. Some of them, they didn't know especially the works from before 89, and they couldn't put them in a, maybe the, in a proper context, or at least the more, more right one, uh, which was just the other way around with, with the Bulgarian audience. The people, they knew more the works before 89. And uh, they, because the galleries, the State Gallery couldn't find any money to borrow any other installation. So all the works which Yara selected, all the works that were presented with a kind of a strange documentation, like a big prints or some kind of leftovers of the objects or films. And this was uh, kind of uh, accepted not so well in Bulgaria. They say, oh, we hear so much things about Netko Solokov and what we see, we see rubbish. Even he didn't paint the plinths uh, like, uh, to make them new ones even though he always taught us that everything must be perfectly done. Did I answer your question a little yeah, bit? Yeah, just a very quick, uh, do you think you're more popular in Bulgaria or outside Bulgaria? In a way, I'm more popular outside Bulgaria. Do we have to finish, I think Claudio? We, yeah. <clears throat> 
if somebody would like to ask a question, this is the last chance because the fair will be closed in minutes. <laughs> so. It's just a quick question, but uh, oftentimes I see that you're writing in English, you know, for example, on the aircraft wings. Is that, uh, do you always just write in English or do you try to write it in the other languages if... Uh... You know, it's just a question of communication, the communicating with the audience. Uh, like some other fellow artists coming from Eastern Europe, I can write in my own language, Cyrillic alphabet, and to make it more exotic, even to sell it better with that exotic writing. But I don't do that because just I want to reach you and to speak with my English sometimes. The English texts, they vary. When I do the little writings on the, on the walls, I never use uh, anybody like an English editor or something. They just pop up. But if you have to do things like uh, on the wings, you have an English editor who has to make it proper English. Otherwise, uh, it will be lost the communication. If you remember the work I've done in Venice 2007, this is about Kalashnikov piece. There was a huge text. It needs like a 15, 20 minutes to read it. And the people, even the people that they would never expect that they would read my stories, they were really kind of reading this text. But it went through three editors, including the, the chief curator of the Biennale as well. <laughs> so can I tell you at the very last moment what actually is written at the end of this yellow blob? At the end of this yellow blob, there is a text which says, I ordered this yellow blob from the exhibition assistants, but later on, I completely forgot the reason for this. So I think this is a good ending. Thank you. <laughs>